I founded the Affordable Housing and Sustainable Communities Initiative at NC State in 2007. Its mission is primarily educational, to educate future leaders in the profession and provide research and design resources for government, nonprofits, community leaders, and the general public. In particular, it emphasizes the roles that the design of the built environment can play in solving problems such as the lack of affordable housing or creating economically, culturally, and environmentally sustainable communities and the ethical responsibility of the design professions to do so. I'll provide a brief overview of the ethical positions I adopt a project background of the initiative, and a 2018 project, Microhousing for Homeless and Disabled Veterans. I'll conclude with a screening of a five-minute film of this project, which actually was a finalist in the AIA Film Challenge in 2019. In the Western philosophic tradition, Ethics provides a framework and praxis for how to best serve the greatest good and includes virtue ethics of personal development and actions, duty ethics of serving others, social contract ethics that seeks equity and justice, and the utilitarian ethics of policies and their enforcement. World religious traditions tend to emphasize morality and favor codes of behavior. However, they also include ethics and ethical values through the dual virtues of developing one's character while serving others for the common good. In the design professions, ethical questions exceed professional standards and provoke reflections regarding who is most served by built environment projects and who is ignored or harmed. The ethical turn in architectural education arguably began in the 1990s with the publication of Building Community, a New Future for Architecture, Education and Practice, a special report, often referred to as the Boyer Report, as its lead author was Ernest Boyer. Its recommendations included re-engaging the profession with the public in contemporary issues and providing the greatest good to the broadest constituencies. It called for schools of architecture to, quote, increase the storehouse of new knowledge to build spaces that enrich communities, prepare architects to communicate more effectively the value of their knowledge and their craft to society, and practice their profession at all times with the highest ethical standards. Since then, the priorities and pedagogy of architectural education have more substantively incorporated sustainability, equity, and even spirituality. However, even though this turn has significantly changed architectural education, it is not without detractors who accuse it of moral majoritism and concerns that expanded agendas will lead to diminished design, aesthetics, and intellectual expertise. Addressing critical issues and envisioning solutions that exceed isolated problems is fundamentally ethical. I often tell my students that what I mostly teach are values. I do not expect that they will remember much of what I tell them, but I hope they will retain how I emphasize the responsibility of architects to improve lives, facilitate community, and support human flourishing. I encourage students to consider their own values and develop them throughout their professional education. The crucible to do so is community-based service learning design studios, where students engage with critical issues of the built environment that can be effectively addressed by schools of architecture. At NC State, we emphasize design excellence, which for me includes activism to effect lasting positive change. As Jason Pearson argues, quoting, 
Design innovation is inseparable from social engagement and thus is inseparable from public service. Projects typically include public fora where students present to and interact with stakeholders, professionals, and public officials. Consequently, while students learn about the power of design to effectively solve problems, they also learn how to be citizen architects, who in the words of architect and educator Samuel Mockby, quoting, stand for solutions that service a community's physical and social needs, not just the status quo. Past projects have included a backyard cottage project, otherwise known as accessory dwelling units. These had been illegal in Raleigh since the 1970s and were identified by the planning department, who initiated the project, as an important first step in creating missing middle housing in a rapidly growing city. Another project supported a campaign to address student housing insecurity and homelessness. It engaged the faculty task force leading campus-wide efforts and, and university administration, and its outcomes comprise an essential component of ongoing advocacy efforts. Most recently, the Affordable and Resilient Housing Project was conducted for a community in a coastal city in North Carolina that has a rich history as a vibrant and resilient African-American community that has withstood racial, economic, and land use discrimination and suffered years of periodic flooding, disinvestment, and population and housing loss. The Microhousing for Homeless and Disabled Veterans Project envisioned design, planning, and programming solutions to veteran homelessness in North Carolina. Microhouse villages are groupings on a single property of microhouses, small, complete, single dwellings that range from 150 to 400 square feet that allow residents to live independently while benefiting from supportive services. During the semester-long project, 11 graduate students conducted research on veteran homelessness and support services, documented precedents and best practices of microhouse villages, and designed prototypical microhouse villages for a variety of sites. The process included a design workshop and presentations to various constituencies. It also incorporated design input from national and local experts on affordable housing and microhouse villages who shared their projects and design approaches during visits to campus. An advisory committee comprising local homelessness, veterans affairs, affordable housing, and design experts provided input at critical points in the project process. A 100-page report and a five-minute film that I will show were produced to assist the advocacy and fundraising efforts of the North Carolina Coalition to End Homelessness, who funded the project. I am committed to employing the research and design capacities of a research-intensive land-grant university to serve its state and citizenry. In addition to service learning projects, I'll, I also engage in local education and advocacy efforts. As a tenured full professor, 
I recognize that I not only have the ability to speak out publicly about controversial issues and challenge those in power, I have a responsibility to do so. Following the accessory dwelling unit studio, I led efforts to amend the city's master plan to allow them. Numerous public fora, op-eds in the local newspaper, regular media coverage, and political activism eventually resulted in a citywide by right ordinance in 2020. Engaged Buddhism is articulated by the Vietnamese Zen monk Thich Nhat Hanh and the liberation theology movement in the Catholic Church are examples of engaged spirituality. They comprise practices centered on serving others, addressing needs, and affecting social change. Contrary to popular spirituality, which focuses on personal development, in engaged spirituality, personal development is the outcome of service. The Zen priest, Bernie Glassman, described it as follows. We commit ourselves to healing others at the same time that we heal ourselves. The projects and partners of the Affordable Housing and Sustainable Communities Initiative illustrate the ethical responsibility of architects and the profession by providing design expertise to the underserved. Even though engaged spirituality is not explicitly part of the initiative, its values inform the studio projects that are chosen, the ethical positions modeled, and the pedagogical methods employed. Similar to public interest design, projects incorporate social, ecological, and economic priorities, known as the triple bottom line, which along with spiritual orientations comprise a quadruple bottom line. I tell my students that architecture is a social art and that each project should satisfy the needs of the client, be contextually sensitive, equitable, sustainable, and meaningful, and also aspire to provide public benefits beyond the project itself. In this way, we can shift from a reactive conventions of a service profession to one of proactive leadership. Consequently, while during the course of the projects, design excellence may be emphasized, its definitions are expanded beyond the instrumental aesthetics and technological materialism of the do dominant architectural culture to incorporate social responsibility, ethics, and the necessity of activism to affect lasting positive change. Home is our hub. Being at home is so important to our sense of self-worth and dignity. Each year, communities around our state do what's called a point-in-time count of the homeless population. It's like a snapshot of the way homelessness looks on any given night in North Carolina. In 2018, there were 801 identified homeless veterans in North Carolina. That's who's experiencing homelessness that night. The number of veterans who actually experience homelessness over the course of a year is closer to about 2,400. When I finally came to grips with the fact that I was, in fact, homeless, um, it was a very, very troubling time for me. I joined the Army in February 2001 as an Airborne Infantryman. Uh, during my six years of service, I deployed three times to Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, was stationed in Korea for a year and Germany for three years. Um, I had a lot of expectations about what life would be after the military, and quite frankly, none of them were true. 
That's when the 2008 market crash happened and uh, everything really kind of came tumbling down. You know, when you, when you look at everything you own right in front of you and, and that's it, no matter how, how hard you've worked in the past, the money you had and the things that you had, when it's, you can literally count it almost on your fingers, it really puts things into perspective and I lost it all. The majority of the veterans that are homeless aren't homeless because that's what they want to be, they're homeless because socially they've hit a roadblock. Once I heard the numbers, that inspired me to uh, do my part to do whatever I, I can. We were approached by Terry Alaba to provide research and design ideas for veteran homelessness. They asked if we could envision micro-housing villages. And these are collections of small, independent living units and how they might be built. We don't want to be pitied. We're not looking for handouts even when we desperately need them. What we're really looking for is a hand up. What we need to successfully house veterans as well as all those who are experiencing homelessness is access to decent affordable housing. We're going to take the work and the studies done by the students here at the school to create two plans. The housing part is something that we could do and, and there was a, a need there so I wanted to do what we could. This was a project that was run as a graduate design studio. As a result, we ended up in the studio with some very talented students. They want to make this world a better place in ways that the built environment has very special roles to play. A microhome is a condensed version of a single family home. But outside of that, all the remaining functions are there. It is going to provide uh, permanent housing for veterans who have experienced homelessness. It's going to be designed in such a way that it's an asset both to how the community looks and feels, but how the community thinks about itself. Being a part of a community uh, is, is incredibly vital because having that community uh, really helps people kind of stay right. And I think microhousing uh, can, can help considerably. There is a deep abiding interest in veterans who might be experiencing homelessness, those who have served our country. It does not rest well with anyone that that man or woman or their families would be rendered homeless. So let's do something. I think it's easy to make a connection with a veteran because you know what they've done. They've sacrificed a certain portion of their lives. I think the beneficiaries of a microhome project like this are everybody in the community. So the, the, the outlook is we're doing good work and we've actually learned what works and we know what to do. And certainly with uh, veterans homelessness, what we've seen is when there's political will as well as increased resources and existing know-how, we can make tremendous strides forward. So if you're truly passionate about it, be the change. Help personally. Helping a vet homeless veteran get himself out of his own problems uh, is one of the best uh, pieces of advice I can give anybody that's focused on this community.